So the titles that are on here locally at the weekend, what exactly are they? So the New South Wales Divisional ST Teams Championship. And the first time in Newcastle, I believe. First time in the state. It's the introduction of a new section of the Teams Championship. Someone tells me Newcastle has a big chance of taking this out. Oh, yes, I think so. Being locals, I think the, the team's got a good chance of knowing their own estuary. It's fixed on Lake Macquarie entirely. And there will be teams coming from any of the 13 divisions that occur throughout the state structure. And how many are teams? Ten in a team with two reserves. And I believe you have limits on the number of fish and the, and the, the judging system is quite complex, right? Well, to try and obtain what could be regarded as an overall result and not cater for specialist fishing, we have a bag limit of 30 per species per competitor, which means once a competitor's caught 30 of a given species, he's got to be versatile enough to go looking for something else to improve his catch. And the size of the fish and the type of fish caught well, can send them in? Yeah. It's worked on a point score system of one point of fish and ten points a kilo, or part thereof. People may think uh, fishing is a very small time recreational sport. It's far from that, isn't it? It's probably the largest recreational activity in Australia, if not the world. Um, recently, the federal government asked the fishing organisations Australia-wide to undertake a survey on their behalf, which was done, and it showed some staggering figures. There are four and a half million Australians participate in recreational fishing as an activity annually, and it returns something in excess of $2 billion to the Australian economy. So it's quite an quite expensive staggering. enterprise. What about from the club point of view, the competitive point of view in fishing, Dave? What, what numbers do you get there? Well, that's a very small section of that four and a half million, obviously. The organised fishing fraternity rates at about 5% of that figure. But that's still a staggering number of competitors on a, a weekly, regular basis when you consider it. When you compare it with bowls and, and the big time, so called big time sports, bowls, squash, netball, and that sort of thing, it rates very highly. It does, but I think, as we mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to. Fishing isn't a, a spectator sport, yeah. sport, it's not a spectator sport. So it doesn't get the coverage and it doesn't have the appeal to the, the home sportsmen that watch through the, the media. of just under one million dollars. The Building Workers Industrial Union has put a ban on the site because of a dispute on a construction site in Sydney. 
The Newcastle Master Builders Association says there's no need to involve the local site. And this sort of industrial anarchy we're not prepared to accept. Let's we... get the record straight. The union wants to be paid money to maintain a picket that stops the contractor from doing the work. The union is asked to be paid by the contractor for the, the purpose of the picket stopping materials and deliveries being made to the site. And of course the contractor won't have a bar of that, nor will we. We think that's a dreadful state of affairs when we're asked to pay money for picketing a site that's been stopped because of action elsewhere. There's no problem at all industrially on the site at Merriweather. Both the apprentice and the supervisor have been told that they won't, won't work on another site in Newcastle. The apprentice has been told that on the completion of his indentures, he won't be granted a BWI, BWIU ticket because he's a scab. And that sort of abuse is not what should be uh, dished out to apprentices. We've written to both the Apprenticeship Commissioner about this matter. I've raised it in the Arbitration Commission. I've written to the Minister for Industrial Relations. It's not the sort of thing that should be happening in this day and age. Four or five days construction work is all that is needed until these units are ready to be occupied. Some paving work, some landscaping and some touch-up painting. But the union bans have prevented elderly people from moving into these units, people who have been on Housing Commission waiting lists already for some years. What about allegations by the master builders that the apprentice on the site has been intimidated by yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, threats are more speech words from the master builders association. I've spoken to him, I've tried to convince him that he's doing the wrong thing, and yes, I've told him uh, that he could jeopardise his future in the industry. Now, if you want to interpret that as threat, then uh, so be it. There are also allegations that the union is demanding payment for maintaining a picket from the construction company. It's quite a legitimate trade union project. Do you think it's legitimate for a trade union to ask a construction company to pay for a campaign that will work against its own interests? Well, it's legitimate to do as we did, which is to warn that construction company that if it tried to break a ban, then we would place pickets and we would be giving them the bill for the expense of those pickets. So it's quite legitimate and there's nothing new about it. Why has it been necessary to spread this dispute to Newcastle when the real trouble seems to be in Sydney? The builder has uh, refused to speak to us on the issue. You can lift the bans on Newcastle and maintain your dispute in Sydney. Well, no, we're not prepared to do that because it's got to such serious proportions that uh, the bans uh, may even be extended uh, if this particular builder has worked to interstate for that matter. Because it is a serious issue and it's a test case which will affect every industry, not just ours. Competition, it nevertheless helps form relationships between the services that carry positive benefits into working situations. That's what the trade is going to be in the current acting 
from the conference this first place of the day includes Montreal Olympian Coughlin, representing the firemen, well-known surf crew, Nunn, also of the fiery, and the police speedster, Freeman. Nunn won the event and Coughlin and Freeman in a time of 26.82, the fastest time of the day. In fact, the fiery got away to a great carnival start by also winning a second race to Hillard, the brothers from the ambulance, and police from Bladen. And so on it went throughout the afternoon. And the overall winner, well, the last report some were still at it. Some had just lost the traditional follow-up barbecue. The others, it was back to work as usual.
it hasn't been the case. With most people forgetting about Christmas for the time being, and concentrating on the food of the In the party stores, where the buzz of Christmas is easily gay, it's been quiet until now. It's the first real sign of Christmas in many times last year. It has been a bit quiet, especially over the last couple of weeks or so. Uh, we're happy with tonight, with quite a few more people out tonight. But I think it's got a lot to do with the coming elections this Saturday. And uh, I think after we get that out of the way, I think it'll be a great Christmas. In the department stores, all the people and things of Christmas have been out for weeks. And the snow-covered Christmas tree is the reindeer. And what would Christmas be without Santa Claus? Already he's been on the receiving end of hundreds of requests from youngsters. And what's he going to bring you? And what's he going to bring you? A tight rifle, yes. Uh, what do you want besides? Uh, what do you like for Christmas? Uh, a watch and a drum. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? You're going to be a good boy for Christmas? Yeah. And you're going to be a good girl? Oh, well, Chas will come and see you. See what the candy has got on his sledge too, won't we? Hey? And of course, once the youngsters have visited Santa Claus, there's always the traditional nativity scene. Well, they tell me this year tradition's taken a dive and bears are in. While the lack of interest from in Christmas so far has left store owners hoping of big sales to come, many members of the Christian faith have seen it as a good thing. So often we begin to celebrate Christmas uh, months before the actual day of December 25. So I'm quite glad that this year there hasn't been uh, quite so much uh, tinsel and glitter about Christmas uh, so early in the, in the season. As a churchman, do you think that the festive atmosphere tends to detract from the real Christian meaning of Christmas? Well, unfortunately, so much of uh, that which we overlay Christmas with, um, which was really meant originally to enhance the festival of Christ's birth, tends to have uh, enabled people to forget what Christmas is about. Good morning everyone and welcome. On many occasions I've reminded you about the importance of a power of attorney. A power of attorney meaning that you are legally appointing someone else to act on your behalf in the event of your absence or incapacity. Now I might give the impression that powers of attorney are only for older people and that's not correct. And I'll give you a personal illustration of what I mean. Our second son Simon left a few weeks ago for a trip to the United States. He's looking for some work experience. Uh, not only in the United States, but also in the UK. Uh, Simon is 23 years of age, and Simon gave his mother and his father, e.g. Bruce Bond, power of attorney before he left, in other words, so that he would have someone in Australia who could act on his behalf in the case of uh, taking up new issues of shares or in the case of buying real estate or whatever it may be. So I again emphasise the importance of powers of attorney in the personal sense as well as in the financial sense. Now, I'm the first to say that in some cases, a power of attorney may not be necessary. But let's anticipate the unexpected. It's far better to have the power of attorney and not need it, rather than have uh, the need of a power of attorney and not have that power of attorney with you, if you understand my meaning. So whether you're 23 or 43 or 63 or 73, whether it's a husband and wife situation, whether it's mother, daughter, a father, son, please give serious thought to exchanging powers of attorney between husband and wife. In the, case, in, in the case of the Bond family, Rosemary Bond and or David Bond and or Simon Bond can act on Bruce Bond's behalf. And in the case of Rosemary Bond, Roland Bruce Bond and or David Bond and or Simon Bond can act on her behalf. I'll leave those thoughts with you and see you next Monday. So while the ceremony is very much a formality, it did give Mr. Beach the chance to examine what has been achieved and say some nice things about the program. Mr. Beach said the federal election was a clear reminder of the importance of rapid start in communicating messages.
candidate for government already needs to do. Artwork provides that rationale to top strike to a wide variety of community groups. The program was still in two summers and is employing three people for a 12 month period. Their work is being seen around the city, grabbing attention to the function of food in the small island. In a very visual society, um, community groups have to compete in the marketplace with a whole lot of other visual messages, television ads, billboard posters, and for community groups to get their message across and to compete in that advertising market, they really do need professional artists working for them. And the idea of this project is to provide that resource to community groups who can't afford advertising agencies. More than 80 delegates from business, community and government organisations attended the summit workshop. Cooperation was the key word at the workshop as Chairman of the Steering Committee, Mr Ron Russell, explained. The aim of the workshop was to bring the communities together such that we could look at what priority should be set for the Hunter region in order that we could determine where our efforts should be directed, particularly in the method of uh, raising finance and determining whether that finance should come from government or from private industry. The workshop recognised the problems within the metal trades and manufacturing industries and urged them to stabilise as well as improve their competitiveness through commitment to cooperative effort and a package of reforms. It also called on the government to review its charges on the coal industry, to develop tourism investment in the region to attract government departments and to complete the Dubbo to Newcastle rail links.